an introduction. Uh, I think the, the topic is, is clear, what we're talking about, because we are confronted, as Marie has already said, with all sorts of um, strange information. I can understand why uh, there is uh, political information out there or why the crisis is used for political purposes. What I fail to understand is uh, why there are also messages out there on medicine, on fake cures to the coronavirus, mm -hmm. and all these very dangerous things. And we've already seen cases, people are sort of following these very strange um, uh, recipes and advice that you find on YouTube and on other social media. And therefore, I'm also glad from a European perspective that we uh, we are having an agreement now with the, Google, with the big uh, social media providers, the platforms, I mean, like, like Google and Facebook and Twitter, to make sure that information is being checked. Uh, what are your plans to change or fix uh, the negative perceptions uh, among the young people within the frame of your public diplomacy and cultural policy? Look, I mean, we all uh, we are all concerned about uh, about this negative perception, um, and we are trying first of all to analyze where does it come from. So you have a number of um, sites and you have a number of sources that are related to Russia um, that are putting out messages basically saying the European Union is collapsing, the European Union hasn't done anything and, and so on. And we're coming out with counter messages um, that have partly to do with the uh, political messages, but also, as I said before, this myths or urban myths about how to um, fight the, uh, the, 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 the pandemic or the, or the disease or how to cure yourself. Then. Um, there, then there's something that's far more difficult to work on. Um, these are This is the impression that people are getting, the ones that basically were part of your first question, the impression that very little has been done, um, very little has been done when it comes to the countries that are most affected. I think here we the only thing that helps is facts. Uh, countries are sending uh, doctors, medical teams, countries are sending protective gears where it is needed to show that this, um, that this very first negative impression that there is no solidarity the members, that is wrong. This is the only way that you need to put hard facts on the table and you need to show the positive impact of what we are doing. Well, this will convince people, nothing else will convince people. Christian's absolutely right. We, we have the facts at our disposal. And in fact, I have here six pages of briefing on what the EU has done for Ireland alone in this crisis. So you have this notion that EU is not helping. We can give you a whole load of statistics. Would you ever bother reading those? Or how would you like to get your information that you know that would make you understand or be interested in the answer? So maybe yes. numbers is not the thing. It's more about social media headlines. Because I don't think anyone will go into a six pages report and just you know uh, read it a, a page by page or a step by step. Um, they need just the headlines. They need to see like headlines like Germany is sending masks to someone, the EU is paying money to someone, the EU is uh, increasing the funding to the WHO, so that they know that actually EU uh, is doing the most possible job that they can do. I want to ask one question, all of you. When you follow the social media, what will these numbers and statistics mean to you? about uh, the corona cases, about uh, the deaths, about what does it mean to you? Do you believe in all of this? Do you think it reflects the true situation in every single country? Actually, I want to believe the statistic, the numbers on the uh, uh, on the internet, because some time to time I'm t uh, I thought that if the if it is not uh, true. Maybe these numbers are more than the reality. So I want to believe it, actually. I have a small problem with all of this because uh, it's so different from country to country. And I believe it's how we collect the numbers of the statistics. Here we go. Yeah. There's a new, a new oh. task for the European Union, harmonizing the data collection. <laughs> Some misinformation and disinformation claim that the virus was bioweapon, a population control. I would like to know, especially about media, what policy does the EU follow in dealing with misinformation and disinformation issues? Could you explain uh, to us the role of the media diplomacy on this occasion? Thank you. Thank this you is, so much. Uh, this is really to the core of the, of the issue. 
Um, I think, um, first of all, we need to identify the wrong information or the fake information. And then we have in the EU, we have a couple of departments, uh, both with member states, but also ourselves in, in Brussels that are charged with actually spotting wrong information, harmful information. And then uh, we are in touch with the big uh, social media platforms to make sure that this information then is taken off uh, the web. Quite a lot of these partners have also taken or have closed accounts that we know are being used to channel fake information, wrong information, harmful information. There's another aspect to this. Um, A, from the side of the institutions and the states, the correct information and the constant feed of information to the media has to take place. But secondly, it is also very important that we have responsible journalists who know their trade, who know what it means to check, double check and triple check uh, information before they, they put it out to the public. So responsible professional journalism, I think, is, is very important that we need to continue providing assistance to any organization um, that is, as we do in Turkey, we have these uh, academies uh, for journalists uh, where journalists can train, where journalists can uh, get information, journalists can use the modern technology to, to work and to, to simulate what, what they're writing. I think we started working in the EU to counter disinformation generally about five years ago when we started to see interference in, in electoral, mm -hmm. internal um, elections. Um, and that got off to a slow start. And there's always that question of, you know, if you're if you're monitoring, are you controlling? And, you know, do you want governments monitoring? And is that censorship? One of the things I think the pandemic does is it reinforces the notion that we're all on the same side here. To what extent do you check your sources? Um, and do you, before you forward something on, check if it's been corroborated somewhere else? Do you check for the blue tick every time? Um, I'd be really interested to know what ex to what extent um, consumers take it seriously. It's really um, important because we should actually the main question is the consumer, the reader, uh, really put effort to reach the real um, news. So as a suggestion from me, we should put effort to reach the real news uh, instead of the fake news. I think in the recent two, three years with the amount of misleading information, especially on social media, I developed some kind of instinct to not believe everything and double check uh, even if it's from a reliable source like uh, The Guardian or even The Independent or BBC, it doesn't matter. You always need to check uh, this information again, see if there is a variable source is, is speaking about it. I think it, it, it's a very interesting question about who is a trusted source. Is, is your government, is your own individual government a trusted source and how do you know? When it comes to COVID-19, I, um, I find it really difficult to believe uh, corrupted regimes like Syria or Egypt or China or Iran and the numbers they gave. I think the space of misleading possibility given to such governments is much higher than the one in Turkey or in the EU or other places. And then my first question to do, dear Ambassador, Mr. Berger. And during Canada, of course, after the COVID-19, what will be the situation of the Erasmus Plus projects? Because the delivering uh, dates were postponed. We have come to a very important conclusion in the European Union that the Erasmus program and the Erasmus Plus program uh, uh, are most successful programs. Uh, and they are successful a, because people like them, um, people, people really enjoy doing it. But also, in our view, they're very successful because we see them as maybe the most important antidote to what, what, what we would call xenophobia or racism or, or you know, Islamophobia, all the phobias that are out there. Um, because they, they, these programs do one thing. They reduce the fear of what you don't know. Uh, so by going out, by being with people of a different background, different color, different nation, different language, you really reduce the fear. There are lots of different scenarios. Oh, we have been trying to, to take care of them in a question and answer uh, list you find on the website of the delegation of the commission. Can you stay where you are? Will you be paid? Where, will you continue to be paid? Will you continue paid when you come back? I mean, all these are important questions and you will find answers to that. Speak with your Erasmus coordinator at your university 
and see if all that doesn't help, go and try to speak with a national agency that is responsible for, uh, for Erasmus. All I can tell you is all of us, universities, institutions, national agency, we will do everything we can to make sure that, that your experience is as still as positive as possible. What's the first thing you're going to do when all this <laughs> film alike situation ends? Uh, well, I don't know what uh, Sonia will do, but I will continue and, and finalize something that I started four years ago, and this has been terribly interrupted now, um, to visit all the UNESCO sites in Turkey. Um, wow. We have done, we have done um, I think, 14 out of the 16, or 16 out of the 18, and there are two missing. Um, <laughs> so um, I, hope, I hope there will be enough time to do it. We will help you. Yes, please. <laughs> well, this is very, very top of my, of my list uh, for the day after. I'm going to run away from my family. <laughs> <laughs> what are your suggestions to be an ambassador for us, actually? Thank you. My advice is, is, is always the same. Um, do not get distracted. Do, if, you got an, if you get a negative answer, don't take a no for a no. Continue pushing. Mm -hmm. And I've seen this and, uh, with the question early on that we discussed about internships. Yeah? You only stand out if you keep insisting, if you keep calling, if you keep writing letters, if you keep, you know, and nobody gets annoyed about it because we have all been in the same boat. We have all done it ourselves. Pursue it. Don't give up. Don't get distracted. Don't let other people tell you this is not good or nonsense or whatever. Um, it's your life. And Christian, right. I mean, there's, there's a lot of practical stuff you have to do, but I will tell you, you can learn anything. What we recruit for is not knowledge, but possibility, but potential and characteristics. So what we're looking for is somebody who can show that they're a team player, that they have empathy, um, that they care about other people, you know, do some volunteering, be able to point to having a, a personality that looks outward and learns from others in addition to the skills that your, your course will give you. I think uh, have curiosity and an adventure for life and go for it. Go for it. That's it. So it's three, two, have a smile. Cheers. And it's done. Oh, <laughs> thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you.